So in the previous lecture, when we distinguished between accounting and economic profit, I used an example for an individual who would be starting a business. Um, and so we valued the equity capital at the amount that they could have made based on their resources being utilized in an alternative uh, use. So if their labor was in the labor market and if their savings was invested in equity capital elsewhere. Um, now we're going to switch gears and talk about accounting versus economic profit for a corporation. And in this case, the value of the equity capital is the shares. And so let's say, for example, I decide to buy shares of Apple stock. And let's say that Apple gives me a prospectus that shows me the past performance of their stocks. And based on my analysis of the past performance of stocks, I assume that I can get a 5% return on those stocks. So notice that I'm expressing it as a percentage. In other words, normally when we talk about somebody's return on their equity capital in a firm, we express it as a percentage and we call that uh, the normal rate of return. So in other words, the idea is that if Apple wants me to continue to keep my equity capital in their firm, meaning continue to uh, maintain their stocks or even purchase more stocks, I need to get at least the normal rate of return. I need to get a 5% return on my stocks because if that firm fails to meet my normal rate of return in in the long run, I'm probably not going to continue to purchase Apple stock and I'll probably sell off the existing stock that I have. So let's say, for example, next quarter, Apple only gives me a 3% return. Again, I'm still making money. In other words, I got a 3% return. However, I didn't get the return I was expecting to make. In other words, I was expecting a 5% return, and Apple only gave me a 3% return. So again, that's the same thing as saying is they're not meeting the opportunity cost. In other words, they're not meeting the opportunity cost of the equity capital. Again, the only reason that somebody buys stock in a company is to make money. And the amount that you're expecting to make, that again is referred to as the equity capital. So again, if I buy Apple stock expecting to make a 5% return and Apple consistently only gives me a 3% return, then that means they're not meeting my opportunity cost and eventually I'm going to want to invest elsewhere, even though I'm actually making positive money. So if we look at this schedule of data, this is actually true information for a quarterly, uh, you know, profits for General Motors. This is prior to General Motors having to get bailed out by the U.S. government. And so what we see is that for this quarter, General Mills had sales or revenues of almost $194 million. So that's what we see right here. Um, their expenses in terms of their land and labor resource costs were almost $179 million. The interest that they had to pay on their outstanding debt was almost $12 million. And so after we subtract out those total explicit costs, we see that their net revenue accounting profit was a little under $3 million. So in other words, they had positive accounting profit. They were making money. However, note that the value of the equity capital was $44 million meaning that shareholders only made collectively $2.8 million. However, they were expecting to make $44 million. So think of that as my example when I talked about myself investing in Apple stock. I invest in the stock expecting a certain return, but I don't get that return. So that's exactly what was happening here. People were only getting, um, you know, the shareholders, the equity holders were only getting about 3% of what they were expecting to get. So in other words, let's say I was expecting a $100 return, I only got a $3 return. So even though it was positive, in other words, I made money, I didn't make nearly as much money as what I was expecting to make. So that is why the value of the economic profit is negative. In other words, General Motors, um, you know, missed the mark by over $42 million. And so what did shareholders start to do? They started to leave.
In other words, they started to pull their money out and invest elsewhere because General Motors was not meeting their opportunity cost. In other words, let's say I had invested in General Motors and I was expecting a 5% return and instead they're giving me a quarter point return. Why would I keep my money there when I can pull it out and invest in another company that is going to give me a 5% return? In other words, that's what I'm looking for is a firm that is going to meet my opportunity cost. So again, what we're emphasizing here is that the accounting profit is not what is important to the firm. In other words, a firm can still have positive accounting profit, but if their economic profit is negative, then the firm isn't going to last in the long run because their equity capital holders are going to be driven away. So we are always concerned with economic profit. So from here on out, when we talk about maximizing profit to the firm, we are always talking about maximizing the economic profit, not the accounting profit. Um, another point to uh, remember when we're talking about the return on our investments, in other words, uh, when you reach the point where you want to start buying stock and become an equity holder in a firm, um, risky investments tend to require higher rates of return, while less risky investments require lower rates of return. So in other words, the reason why one stock may be telling you you're going to get a 20% return versus another stock that's saying that you're going to get a 5% return is simply because because of the risk involved. So the higher the risk, in other words, the higher the likelihood that you may lose your money, your equity capital, the higher the return the firm is going to have to offer you. Now let's say, for example, that I gave you the following data for a corporation and I wanted you to calculate out both the accounting profit and the economic profit. So again, the first thing that you're going to do is calculate out the firm's accounting profit. So accounting profit is total revenue, so in this case their total revenue was $400 million and then you subtract out all of the explicit costs, the actual tangible costs that they had to pay. So they obviously had to pay the rent on their land, which was 100 million. They had to pay the labor, the wages to the employees, which was 50 million. And then they have to pay in any interest that they have on their debt, which was another 50 million. So at the end of the day, the accounting profit was $200 million. So they had positive accounting profit. The next thing we can do is now calculate the value of their economic profit. And the way that we calculate economic profit is we take that accounting profit, which we said was $200 million, and we subtract out any equity capital. So in other words, what were the shareholders of, these co of this company expecting to make? So it states here that their equity capital was valued at $100 million. So $200 million minus $100 million means that we still have $100 million left over. So that means we have positive economic profit. That's the same thing as saying that, you know, the firm made their shareholders twice as much as they were expecting to make. In other words, we said the equity capital was only $100 million. However, they made $200 million. So in other words, they made twice as much as the firm was, uh, as their equity shareholders were expecting. We refer to this as positive economic profit. Positive economic profit is the best case scenario for a firm. In other words, it occurs when the company is returning more to its owners than the owner's opportunity costs. So again, going back to my example where I said I was going to buy Apple stock and I was expecting a 5% return, positive economic profit would be if they gave me like a 10% return. So not only did I make the amount of money I wanted to make, I made more than I wanted to make. So positive economic profit not only keeps current shareholders happy, but it's going to induce more people to invest in your company. You're going to eventually have more people that want to hold equity in your firm. Um, so it will entice more investors and new investors will continue to buy stock until the economic profit goes back down to zero. So again, positive economic profit is the best case scenario for the firm. 
The opposite of positive economic profit is going to be if we have negative economic profit. So in other words, let's say, for example, our accounting profit in the previous example had only been $100 million. So we made $100 million, although the actual shareholders were expecting to make $150 million. So in that case, we missed the mark by $50 million. Therefore, our economic profit would be a negative $50 million. So again, I was expecting to make you know $150 but I only made $100 so even though I made money I didn't make as much as I was expecting to make the firm did not meet my opportunity cost so not only is that going to possibly cause me to want to invest in another company but it's certainly not going to entice any new investors nobody's going to want to buy shares in a company and become an equity holder if a firm is having negative economic profit not meeting the opportunity opportunity costs of their shareholders. So negative economic profit is the worst case scenario for a firm. The last type of profit that a firm can have is what we call zero economic profit. And this occurs when the company neither adds value or subtracts value. Um, so the amount of revenue that they bring in is actually going to equal the total cost, including opportunity costs. So think of it as I was expecting a 5% return and I received a 5% return. So in other words, I'm they met my opportunity cost. They made just the amount of money that I was expecting to make. This is also sometimes called normal accounting profit because a lot of firms, this is the only type of profit that they can expect to make in the long run. They make just enough money to cover all of their costs, including the value of the equity capital. So it would be as if the accounting profit was 100 and the value of the equity capital was 100, so 100 minus 100 equals zero. So in other words, that's why it's called zero economic profit, because we made just enough money to cover all of our costs, including opportunity costs. So we keep our current shareholders happy. In other words, if I am expecting to make a 5% return and I get a 5% return, then there's no reason for me to want to move my equity elsewhere. In other words, it's keeping me happy. I'm, it's The firm is meeting my opportunity cost. It just doesn't necessarily entice any new investors. In other words, generally to entice new equity holders, you need to have positive economic profit. People need to think they're going to make more with your company than what they can make elsewhere. So make sure that you understand the difference between the three different types of profit that a firm is going to make. Again, if they have positive economic profit, it keeps their current shareholders happy and it attracts new investors. If they have negative economic profit, it's going to drive investors away, including their current shareholders. And zero economic profit is where they're making just enough money to cover the opportunity cost of their equity holders and so neither attracts nor drives investors away. Now, even though economic profit is the profit that firms are concerned with, and that is the profit we are referring to when we talk about a firm maximizing profit, accountants generally do not report economic profit because it's very difficult to calculate because obviously the opportunity costs are going to be different from shareholder to shareholder. Um, so although it is hard to calculate, firms are increasingly offering information on economic profit to their investors. And so that would be information that you would get in the firm's uh, prospectus that they give you if you are thinking about investing in that company. And then a last point that I want to state about accounting versus economic profit in terms of the values is that because we calculate economic profit by subtracting equity capital from accounting profit, that means accounting profit should have a higher value than the economic profit. In other words, just the simple mathematical calculations make that, um, you know, uh, that fact true. So um, when you are calculating your accounting and economic profit, if your number for economic profit is greater than accounting profit, then you know you've done something wrong. 
Okay, so now that we have discussed how we calculate economic profit and how the firm is basically always wanting to maximize economic profit, we need to apply this back to our demand curves. Um, re recall that what we're trying to do is figure out what is the point of production, how much output should the firm produce in order to maximize their profits. So in other words, to figure out a firm's profit margin, we know profit is simply total revenue minus total cost. So let's say, for example, that we have a demand curve that looks like so. And I want to know what the profit is for my firm. Well, the first thing I need to know is what is the price that I'm charging. So let's say I decide to charge a price of $10. So I come across and I see where does $10 correlate along my demand curve. So it's going to be right there. So that will tell me the quantity demanded at $10. So I come down here and let's say the quantity demanded is 5 So to figure out total revenue, we know total revenue is simply price times quantity. So in this case, price times quantity is going to be 10 times 5. So the total revenue is going to be $50. Now I need to figure out what are my total costs. Well, we just learned in the last chapter all of our different cost functions. And if we want to know, since we know here what we're charging for each unit, it's, in other words, we're charging $10, we want to know how much is each unit of output costing us. So the function that we need on here is our average total cost function. So I'll go ahead and add that in here. So let's say if I graph my average total cost curve, this is what it ends up looking like. So what I'm doing is I'm looking for the point at which I intersect my average total cost curve. So that's going to be right here. So then I pull that across to see what is my cost per unit. So let's say my cost per unit was $6. So now I can calculate out what my total costs are because the total cost to the firm is just going to be the average cost per unit times the quantity of output. So in this case, my average cost per unit is $6. I'm producing five units of output, so my total cost are $30. So now that I've calculated out what my total revenue is and what my total cost is, now I can see what my profit is, because profit is total revenue minus total cost. So my profit margin would simply be 50 minus 30, 20. So my profit is $20 if I set a price of $10 based on the current demand for my good. But how do I know that that's where I maximize my profits, right? In other words, I can calculate what my profit margin would be at every point along the demand curve. In other words, what if I wanted to set a price of $11? I can do the same thing. I can see what is the quantity demanded, what would be the total revenue, what would be the total cost, figure out the profit. What if I set a price down here of $4? I can do the same thing, come across, see what the quantity demanded would be, calculate the total revenue in relation to the total total cost, see what the profit is. Wouldn't it be great if we just had a shortcut? In other words, rather than having to calculate out the profit margin at every single price point, wouldn't it be nice if we just had something, some kind of formula that just automatically told us what point will always be our profit maximizing point? Well, lucky for us, we do have that. We have something that is called our supply rule. The supply rule basically is going to be where we produce an offer for sale, the quantity at which marginal revenue equals increasing marginal cost. In other words, if we just produce where marginal revenue equals increasing marginal cost, we will always either maximize our profit or minimize our losses. And the reason why I say minimize our losses is because sometimes the supply and demand conditions in the market don't allow us to make a profit. So in that case, we would still produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost because that is where we would minimize our losses. So again, we don't actually have to calculate our profit margins for every single price level based on the demand. All we have to do do is produce the quantity of output that corresponds with the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. 
So if you're looking at a table of data, all you have to do is go down your columns to find the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So notice that we, I have my two columns of data right here, and if I go down, I see the point at which they equal each other is right here at eight units of output. At eight units of output, my marginal revenue is $1,000, and at eight units of output, my marginal cost is $1,000. Therefore, this would be the point that I produce at. In other words, I don't need to figure out what my profit margin is at every other level of production because I already know that that is going to be the point at which I maximize my profit. Now the reason why this is where we always maximize profit is because remember that marginal revenue is simply the additional revenue that we get from selling one more unit of output. Um, and again, if producing and selling that one more unit of output increases uh, cost less than it increases the revenue, that is, if the marginal cost is less than the marginal revenue, then producing and selling that unit will increase profit. However, if the production of one more unit costs more than the revenue obtained from the sale of that unit, then producing and selling that last unit will decrease profit. So again, once the marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, producing more will increase profit, whereas when marginal revenue is less than marginal cost, producing more will lower profit. So we just want to find the point at which they equal each other and on a graph that is going to be the point at which those curves intersect. So let's look at what it would look like graphically in terms of figuring out where a firm would produce at. So again we need to start out with our graph. We have our downward sloping demand curve for good. Now what we also need on this graph is the firm's marginal revenue curve. So let's say their marginal revenue curve is right here. And then of course we need their marginal cost curve. So let's say uh, the marginal, excuse me, hold on. Okay, let's say their marginal cost curve is right here. And now, again, if I want to figure out, okay, what price point does this firm charge to maximize profits, all I need to do is find the point where marginal revenue equals increasing marginal cost. That's going to be right here where they intersect. So that tells me the quantity of output that the firm is going to produce. So let's say that's at 10 units of output. And then I just pull that up to see what price that corresponds with along our demand curve. So I intersect my demand curve right there, come across, and let's say that that is a price of $10 also. So in other words, now I know that the firm, in order to maximize or minimize their profits, they need to charge a price of $10 where they will be selling 10 units of output. Now, to know whether or not this firm is having a profit or a loss, I need my average total cost curve on this graph also because that's going to tell me my cost per unit and whether or not this firm is making money or losing money. So again, let's say my average total cost curve is right here. So again, I do the same thing. I find the point at which I intersect my average total cost curve. So let's say I'm intersecting it right here. I pull that across and that will tell me what my average cost per unit is. So in this case, my average cost per unit is $5. So we can clearly see that this firm is maximizing profit. In other words, they're charging a price of $10, but their costs are only $5. So if I asked you to shade Again, if I asked you to shade in the firm's profit margin, you would simply shade in this area right here. In other words, the difference between what it's costing you per unit and what the price of the product is. So again, this rectangle right here represents the firm's profit. And again, if you wanted to know the amount, you can just use some basic math, you know, base times height. So the height is 5, the base is 10, 5 times 10, their profit margin is $50. If I asked you to graph the firm's costs, well, we said the costs are up to everything up to $5, so that would be this rectangle down here. This yellow rectangle would represent the total cost to the firm. And then, of course, if I asked you to graph the firm's total revenue, well, then for total revenue, you're going to graph that entire rectangle. In other words, the total revenue represents the total amount of money that the firm is bringing in. And we already said that total revenue is price times quantity. So the price is $10. The, t the quantity is 10 
So this entire area would represent the total revenue. So again, the turquoise is the total revenue. The uh, green is the profit. And the yellow is the cost. So again, you want to make sure that you understand how to read and interpret the graphs because these are the types of problems that you will be getting on your problem set. And then, of course, another thing that I want to point out about this graph is that this graph represents a firm having positive economic profit. So this is positive economic profit that is occurring for this firm. Let's see what it would look like if a firm was having negative economic profit. So again, we start out with the same thing. We have to have our demand for the product. We have to have the marginal revenue curve on the graph. And then, of course, we need to have our marginal cost curve on the graph, too. Find the point at which the two curves intersect. So again, let's say that's right here. That tells you the quantity that you're going to produce. Pull it up to the demand curve to see what the corresponding price is that you're going to charge. And now, of course, to know whether we're making money, we need our average total cost curve on this graph. So let's say that my average total cost curve was up here. Again, now look and see at 10 units of output, my average total cost per unit, I'm intersecting up here, my average total cost per unit is higher than the price that I'm charging. Let's say it's $11. So in this case, the firm, when they produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, they're actually minimizing their losses. In other words, they're charging $10 per unit, but their cost per unit is $11. So if I asked you to shade in this firm's profit or loss, you would actually be shading in this little rectangle right here, but instead of a profit, you're shading in the firm's loss. That's how much money they're losing. Um, and then, of course, if I asked you to shade in their total cost, the total cost would be this entire rectangle right here. And there was all the way up to the $11. It's costing them $11 per unit. So the red would be the total cost, whereas the green would be the firm's loss. Um, and then, of course, if I asked you to shade in the firm's total revenue, that's when you would just shade it up to whatever the price is of the product. So the price is only $10, so the total revenue for the firm would be this right here. So again, any time your cost per unit is higher than what you're charging for your price, the firm is going to have negative economic profit. So that is what's happening right here. Any time a firm is having a loss, they are experiencing negative economic profit. So again, that's what this graph represents. And then the last type of profit that we can have would just be if you're having normal accounting profit. So you have your demand curve. You have your marginal revenue curve, and of course we need our marginal cost curve. And that tells us the quantity of output we're producing. Pull it up. Tells us the price. And then we need our average total cost curve on here also. So let's say our average total cost curve was like that. Well, now we see that the average cost per unit is also the price that we're charging. In other words, the price is $10 and the average total cost is $10. Because the average total cost equals the price, we're just having normal accounting profit. It's costing us $10 and we're charging $10. So again, this represents just what we call normal accounting profit or zero economic profit. And so again, a lot of firms can only have zero economic profit in the long run. So again, in, the ca in this case, if I asked you to shade in the firm's total revenue or the total cost, they would both be the same thing. In other words, the total amount of revenue we're bringing in actually equals the total cost also. And so that would just be this entire rectangle right here. This entire rectangle represents not only total revenue, but also the firm's total cost. And then, of course, there's no shading in a profit or a loss because we're just having zero economic profit.